my name's Vanessa King. I'm um, from the social movement Action for Happiness. Hands up here, who's heard of Action for Happiness? Oh, so probably about a quarter of the room. Well, so it's great to be here. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the science of happiness. And, and we'll explore what we mean by happiness shortly. And it builds, it really connects with what Chris, Trudy and Angela have just said. And it's just so exciting to be here. I can't tell you because I feel absolutely passionately about the NHS. I think it's, it's our national treasure. And I've spent quite a lot of time in America where 40% of people do not have health care. So, you know, we should be immensely proud of what we have and you should feel immensely proud of what you contribute to our society and what you model for the rest of the world. So, uh, for me, if I can contribute something to your well-being today, that's something that I feel very humbled by. It's not for me. But this, this science um, is stuff... It's new and emerging science, very recent science, that is helping us take happiness and well-being more seriously. And it's made a difference to my life, and I know it's made a difference to lots of the people that Action for Happiness has touched. So, but it's a, an exploration, really. This is all about you thinking about what does this stuff mean for you. Action for Happiness, just a little bit about who we are. Because it's kind of unusual. We're a social movement, we're a charity, but we were founded by one of the top economists in the UK. Economists, if any of you know any of them, are not known for their soft and fluffy stuff. Um, they usually think about hard stuff, like GDP per capita there. Um, how much we produce for, you know, economically per head of the population. And to date, that has been the primary measure of social progress across the world. So when countries think about how they're making progress, they look at that one single number. And if we look at trends of GDP, whether from the 1950s or the 1970s, that has trended upwards. Yes, there's been blips up and down. Yes, it's an average, um, but it's trended upwards. Yet if we look at how happy people we feel, and that's that red line there, Economists often look at um, life satisfaction, how satisfied am I with my life to date. Um, that has best flatlined. And we know that mental ill health is rising. So this focus of societies on the financials alone, it's important. The financial stuff is important. It can't be ignored. But it is not sufficient. And Richard argue, uh, Professor Lord Richard Layard, who Angela may well bump into at the House of Lords tomorrow, um, um, argued this case in a book in 2005. And people said, well, OK, we buy that argument. And actually, the UK is the second country in the world to include uh, subjective well-being um, statistics like um, life satisfaction in our national statistics. So we're starting to measure this stuff across the country. So people said, OK, we buy that argument, so how do we close that gap? And that's how Action for Happiness is born, is helping policymakers from the top down and people from the ground up and workplaces, schools and the healthcare systems from the middle out help in that. And it's been aided by a real shift that happened in psychology um, about 20 years ago, around about the same time as Richard was arguing this, the psychologist, eminent psychologist who'd really um, influenced the way depression was regarded and treated, Martin Seligman, he's, I, who I studied with, he realised that actually what we've done as a society is focus on, um, in psychological research, we'd focused on zero to the minus side of the spectrum. So we'd focused on why do people get sick why do we have psychology, um, psychological ill health? Why do we have dysfunction? And how do we treat and cure that? So get people back to zero. But psychological research had not focused on how do we actually increase people's psychological well-being, their psychological fitness, if you like, and that, which enhances their experience and quality of life and actually builds resilience to um, ill health. 
So in the last 20 years, research in this area has exploded. And that's a little bit about what I'm going to share with you today. Some, give you a little introduction, some signposts into how you can find out more. But before we start getting into that, what is happiness? I mean, how many of you, if I said to you, you know, what do you ultimately want in your life? If you had to choose one thing, what would you choose? Or if you've got kids, what do you want for your kids? How many of you would say, well, I had to choose one thing. Well, I kind of, I don't want to be happy. Or I want them to be happy. Hands up if that's what you'd answer. Most of us, most of us. But how much time do we spend thinking about, well, what does happiness really mean? And what does it really take in terms of the way we live our lives? So let's just who knows, well, what does happiness mean to you? Shout out some things that what, when you think about happiness, when you really think about happiness, what does it mean? Shout out a few, a few things. Contentment. Some doing things you enjoy. You having things to aspire to. Joy. What about down here? Achieved, did you say? Feeling like you're, making, you're achieving things. Other things? Laughter. laughter. Connecting. Did you say, somebody say connecting with people? Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah. There's a whole lot of ingredients that go into to how happy we feel. And this is, in a, in, a, in a presentation on happiness, you have to have a picture of a Buddhist monk. <laughs> this is the only one. Does anyone know who he is? This is Matthew Ricard. He's a former biochemist or biogeneticist or something um, who became a Buddhist monk. And he's said to have the happiest brain on the planet. He hates being told that. But because um, a lot of the early neuroscientific studies on the effect of meditation on the brain were done on his head. And his brain is very different to our brains, the condition of his brain. So um, that's Matthew Ricard. But he describes happiness as more um, than a sort of fleeting, pleasurable feelings, but a, a deep sense of flourishing or an optimal state of being. And I like that word optimal because it takes a, into account the sort of dynamic nature of it. The ancient Greeks talked about two sorts of happiness. They talked about hedonia, which is pleasure, which is where the word hedonism comes from. And whilst you can have too much of a good thing, a little bit of a good thing, as we'll explore shortly, actually does us good. But they also talked about a different sort of happiness as well. They had the two in parallel. They talked about eudaimonia, which is a sense of fulfillment, satisfaction, feeling like you've lived a good life. So you, maybe you've worked hard towards aspirations. Um, you've achieved um, goals. You've worked hard towards having a, a, a happy, healthy, well-connected, you know, well um, um, good relationships with your family, etc. And actually working towards those things that give us that sense of eudaimonic well-being or fulfillment doesn't always feel good, does it? Sometimes it's bloody hard work and a struggle. Yeah? And that's where some of the, the two types of happiness working in parallel really helps because sometimes having little drip feeds of ple more pleasurable moments of that type of happiness or joy along the way can help us um, towards the sort of a, life, a, a feeling that we've lived a good life, a sense of long-term fulfillment. So in short, um, when we talk about happiness, we talk about a mixture of those two things. It's a blend of those. We might talk about, and I use the word happiness, psychological well-being, and even resilience interchangeably because they're, different, they're all different sides of the, exactly the same coin. But in short, I really like, you know, you, we could talk a bit. It's about how do we get ourselves into a state where we are on balance, functioning well, and feeling good. So that's the sort of shorthand. So where are we going next? There we go. Um, and as I said, research in the last 20 years has exploded in thinking about why does this stuff matter? Does it matter? Um, and what are the ingredients of well-being? So let's think about how does feeling happier, feeling psychologically well, affect our physical health? 
So we know that people who are happier are significantly less likely to catch a cold. They're less likely to have cardiovascular disease. They're more likely to take care of them, their, uh, their health. They're even more likely to live longer. In fact, some studies have sh suggested that people in the upper quartile of, of, of sort of emotional levels of high, you know, sort of emotional sort of happiness um, live on average 10 years longer than people in the lowest quarter. Bearing in mind that not smoking gives you an average seven years life expectancy, makes you think, well, huh, maybe there's something we need to pay attention to here. What about a work? Um, we know that doctors who um, are in a more um, upbeat mood make faster, more accurate diagnoses. We know in causal studies done in, um, of work type conditions done by economists at Warwick, Andrew Oswald and his team found that people who were happier were 12% more productive with no loss in quality. We know that organizations that pay attention to this stuff, and this is the 100 best companies to work for, if you invested in those, um, their shares 26 years ago, you would have had your returns would have been 3.8% higher than the stock market average year on year. So there's a, there's a real kind of benefit to these intangible. And we also know that young people's well-being, um, their emotional health, um, age 16, for example, is more predictive of, of um, good career outcomes and success than, and than academic achievement. So, but it goes on. So there's an advantage to our physical health. There's an advantage um, at work, there seems. But what about bigger than that? What about the societal implications of, of people feeling happier? Um, we know that happier people help others more. We know that they're less likely to engage in risky behaviours, for example, on the road. We're more they're more likely to be financially responsible. They're even more likely to vote and participate. May not always be a good thing. We know that this stuff is also contagious. How many of you here have been affected by somebody else's mood states? For good or for ill? Some Harvard psychologists and medics, because actually this came from a big study called the Framingham Heart Study. It was looking at health behaviours um, and how those rippled through real social networks. This is a real social network from Framingham, so there's sort of blobs of people. And they found that people's, how happy people felt had a ripple effect out to not just the people they were in direct contact with, but the people those people were in direct contact with and those people were in direct contact with. So how happy we feel, you know, just our state, how we are, has a statistically significant ripple effect out to three degrees of separation. So we are affecting people we have never met and they are affecting us. So how many of you here have had well-being goals before. They're, you kind of get, must go to the gym, must do mindfulness, uh, must do, you know, do my painting or whatever it is your hobby is, but you never quite get around to it. How many of you? Yeah, many of us do that because we always put the tasks we have to do for others first. So when I came across this research... It made me think, well, actually, taking care of my own well-being is actually not just for me. It's, about, it's for other people, too. And if you think about what it's like you know, at work, you know, if you're taking care of your own well-being, that has an impact on your colleagues and, of course, on your patients um, that you work so hard to care for. So this is a, your well-being, as Chris and Angela and Trudy have already said, is really worth taking seriously because it's not just for you; it's for other people. And you know, and we have we're a, we're important for each other's well-being too, which we'll explore. So this, I think, is a really for me was perfectly, per, you know, really personally impactful because I was always the person that put um, my well-being last. So and I'm trying not to do that now. Can we change how happy we are? So it's all very good. It has an impact for physical health, for society, for performance at work. It has an impact on others. But what can we do to change it? Now, there are lots of things that impact how happy we feel in the moment and, you know, on ge in general in our life. And some of those things we can't change. You know, our genetic inheritance, our early upbringing, 
has an influence and you can make a change around some of those, you know, those, but it's kind of hard to change who your parents are. Some of us have tried, not very successfully. Our circumstances, where and how we live, um, our income levels and things, of course, play an influence. But once we've got our basic needs met, we've got somewhere safe to live, we've got enough money to afford the basics in life, actually, the effort to improve those doesn't always pay a major return in, in happiness terms. So, um, so, you know, that, for most of us here in this room, um, you know, we can influence those things, but it may not have as much um, impact as we'd hope. But the research is showing that a significant amount of how we feel is down to how we think, our thought patterns and behaviours, uh, and, yeah, and our behaviours. And that's really good news. That's really good news. Because that's what's in cont our control to change. With habit and intention, that's with our control to change. And the good news is, the science is also showing that you can indeed teach old dogs new tricks. When I first studied psychology a few decades ago, um, my first degree was psychology um, and biology, um, it was thought that your brain was pretty much fixed by um, your early 20s, and it was all downhill from then. You couldn't really learn anything very much new, and that's been totally disputed um, now, and we know that, um, many of you will know this, that our brains remain plastic, con you know, changing um, throughout the course of our lives. And yes, there are periods when it's super plastic, but we can all learn new things. So, what can we do that makes a difference? So, well, which is what today is all about. So, what I did when, for, when I, I've been involved with Action for Happiness, I'm on the board um, and I lead on the psychology side and the workplace side, in fact. But when we started, we know that we needed to tell, you know, share people the name is about Action for Happiness, is about doing stuff. Um, what do people do? So I'd um, um, drill down the literature, drill down through the Foresight Report, which is a huge um, piece of re a review of the research that the government did in 2008 uh, called Mental Capital for the 21st Century, um, looked at what they talked about, and then looked at... I'd just come back from studying a master's degree in this stuff uh, uh, with Martin Seligman um, at the sort of epicentre for this stuff in... In the, in the world, in the US, um, University of Pennsylvania, so all of that. And I came up with the areas that the research shows we can most readily take action in to increase our psychological well-being, to increase happiness. Now, this is not all the ingredients that go into feeling happier, but these are the things that are most readily in our control. We call them the 10 keys to happier living. There's a little booklet for, uh, in, in, your, in your bags. Um, and just a little bit about that. But beneath each of these, they may seem deceptively simple. Beneath them is a wealth of evidence and a wealth of evidence-based interventions you can try. But that's just for ideas. So the first five, are, if you know the five ways to well-being, um, many of you will be familiar with those. The first five align with the five ways to well-being. We've since updated them a little bit because the five ways were to well-being were developed in 2009, and there's a little few tweaks in the literature. Um, but those, I tend to think of things that we do in the outside world that affect how we are on the inside. The second five are more things that are internal states. Because sometimes, as you said, when Chris was asking you to list out some of the things that impact negatively impact your well-being, were kind of feeling angry with yourself, lack of confidence, um, feeling overwhelmed... Those sorts of things are more internal states that affect how we are in the outside world. So I tend to talk about this as an um, outside-in, inside-out um, model of well-being. So it's interesting to think about those. And there's actions we can take in all of those. But most importantly, I want you to think about this as a menu. It's not a prescription. We are all different, and Angela talked about this. We're all different. And we need different things at different times. So this is a, a checklist that can help us think about what are we doing currently that really supports our well-being that we need to maintain. And what are the, thing, the areas that we can actually perhaps invest a little bit more attention or time or energy into. 
And, you know, and, and it's a toolkit as well um, in terms of, you know, sometimes we just need a little boost, so what can we try? So we're going to do, um, have a play with a few of these right now. Are you up for an experiment? Experiment one. Ooh. For this, you will need a piece of paper, and you've got pads, these rather lovely pads on your table, and you've got um, pens or pencils. On your own, this is for you to reflect back on your day yesterday. <laughs> um, are some of you thinking, yeah, oh God, that was just like horrendous. Doesn't matter. Try it, try it, try it. Even more especially important to try it. I want you to think about three things you enjoyed, were grateful for, were pleased about. And write, you know, a word or two. This is just for you. Write the, just a word or two to remind yourself what they were. Maybe why they were good. And even if yesterday was really, really terrible... Try and squeeze out a few good things. It might be that you, know, you were late, you were rushing for work, blah, 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 but somebody um, let you in in the traffic or you, on the way back from work you got a seat on the bus or somebody noticed you were having a, 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 a tough day and gave you a smile or bought you a cup of tea. So whatever it is, doesn't matter how tiny it is, tiny things count just as much as big things. So three good things from yesterday, enjoy, grateful, pleased about, just make a note for yourself and then we'll play with this. <laughs> All right, and I'm guessing by the buzz that you've got a few things written down. What was it like? How did it feel reflecting back to yesterday and thinking about three things that you enjoy, grateful for, or pleased about. How did that feel? Good in a kind of nice, gentle sort of way. You know, just, just mild feeling. Not a woo! Just a just mild. Yeah. Well, what you've just done was having a psychological and a physiological impact on you. In fact... People were asked in a random controlled trialed experiment to do exactly the same thing as I've asked, asked you to do there. Write down three good things um, and a note um, on why. People were asked to do this each night for one week. Their happiness was leveled using a multi-factor measure of half scale of happiness, measured immediately after doing that, and then at periods at six month, out to six months later. They found that doing that activity um, each night for one week increased people's happiness. For those, it's the green line, the top line there. Increased people's happiness. And it kind of continued trending upwards over the six months. Their tendency towards um, displaying depression-type symptoms trended downwards. Now, how long did that take you to do, to write that down? Just now, those three good things? Maybe a minute, maybe two. Multiply that by seven. It's in this experiment. So maybe 10 to 15 minutes for one week. That's not a bad return on investment, is it? Why did it work? Why did it work? Somebody say that? What is Why did it work? You're concentrating on the positive, absolutely. Other thoughts? You're bringing back the memories. Other thoughts over here? Do we have any thoughts over there? You're reliving the happy moments. All of those ideas are right. Could we click on? What you've just done is, in fact, a brain training exercise. It is literally a brain training exercise. Because our brains are hardwired to focus on what's wrong. And there's really good evolutionary reasons for that because our brains were formed when we were hunters and gatherers out there on the savannah we were and in those days believe it or not life was actually inherently more dangerous more risky less secure when we were hunter and gatherers than it is now we had to be constantly surveying our environment for risks so our brains learn to interpret any rustle in the grass 
as potentially a source of danger. There might be a lion or tiger there thinking that we looked pretty good to eat. So our brains became finely tuned to notice what's wrong and interpret ambiguous or neutral information in our environment as potentially dangerous. Can we flick to the... So Paul Ekman, who was a, is a, in a, probably the preeminent emotion psychologist, um, and he, he spent some time looking at emotions that were cross-cultural, that could be interpreted read in the same way by all sorts of different cultures and societies. And he initially labelled six universal or primary emotions, and for those that you can see. So for those of you that can see, can you shout out the top left-hand one? What's, what emotion she's, is, is she displaying? Anger. This one? Shock. What about him at the top, in the middle? Fear. Her? Disgust. Happy? Sad. What do we notice about the ratio there? Five to one. Five to one. Because that really, it served us well. It served us well when we were hunters and gatherers to just be, to you know, err on the side of, a, of caution and, um, you know, and interpret the risk because, because life, there was, we were facing life or death every day. But what, what um, those experiences of unpleasant emotions do, and I talked about the physiological as well as the psychological effect, all emotions have a physiological component. Um, action tendencies, they're called. Um, you know, for example, the most well-known one is fear. You know, what's the action tendency when we, when we feel a spike of fear? What, do we, what, are we, uh, what does our body prepare to do? Fight or flight. Absolutely, absolutely. It's the most extreme one. But all emotions have a physiological component. But what happens when we're in an unpleasant emotional state, and I prefer the word unpleasant to negative emotions because sometimes these things are actually, you know, unpleasant emotions are actually positive, so it's good to be fearful sometimes um, when we are facing danger. But what they do is they narrow our perceptual fields. Because if you've got a source of danger, if you're a hunter and gatherer and you've got a kind of hungry lion hurtling towards you, you do not want to be smelling the roses. You want to be damn focused on that, on that lion so you can decide how best to act to keep yourself safe. Our brains are designed to keep us safe. So um, unpleasant emotions narrow our perceptual fields. Okay. Um, but what psychologists in the last 20 years have found, and this has been led by um, Barbara Fredrickson at University of Chapel Hill, um, North Carolina, and she's a psychobiologist. She has found that when we're in a pleasant emotional state, the opposite happens. Our perceptual fields are literally broadened and opened. So when I first studied psychology, it used to be thought the only emotions that really matter were those ones that kept you alive, like fear. Uh, um, but the, you know, and the pleasant emotions were kind of nice to have, but they didn't really serve much purpose. But her research has shown absolutely the opposite. It's a mild, slow build effect, but it has a strong effect over time. So when we're in a pleasant emotional state, our perceptual fields broaden, meaning we are more open to other people, we are more trusting from, of others, we recognize people from other cultures better, we are more open to ideas. We see more options. We are more flexible in our thinking. We are um, better at solving complex problems, etc., uh, etc., etc. Et and little by little by little, that builds our psychosocial resources. She calls it, Barbara Fredrickson calls this, the broaden and build theory of, of positive emotions. And there's even evidence, uh, you know, uh, for example, an uh, extreme example of which is Matthew Ricard, who talked about his happy brain, um, that there's even evidence that a daily diet of pleasant emotions st undoes some of the damage that cortisol and the stress, prolonged exposure to stress hormones does in our brain. So this is rather than a nice to have, a drip feed of these small moments is a really powerful um, thing that we can do for our well-being. It's a great thing that you can do with your families. I want you to think about that idea of those three good things. Um, you know, how could you use that? Do you want to sit down and use it? You know, each night, keep a pen and paper by your bed 
Um, people who did that in the experiment helped them sleep. Maybe it's something you want to use to transition from home to work or work from to home. Maybe it's something you want to do with your family. Maybe it's even something you could do in your teams at work. One of the guys, um, I run uh, leadership and management training around some of this stuff and looking about how it embeds in leadership style. And I was uh, running a course for a big telecoms company and a guy there in the audience, uh, in, the, in, in the group, and he was like this really cynical about all this stuff. And what are you talking to me about happiness for? And um, he was a bit like that. He'd been in the organization about 35 years, ran a huge team of field engineers, you know, salt of the earth going out, fixing problems in the roads, all that sort of stuff. Um, but anyway, he, we, the, the, he, we did a day, then they had to go away for three weeks and do some experiments and come back and show what happened. And he came back, second session, and he goes, I tried that three good things. He said, didn't call it three good things. In fact, we called it bright spots. And in fact, we didn't do three, we just did one. I did it with my team. He said, I asked my team to come to each meeting and we kicked off with one good thing. One good thing, one bright spot. You know, whether from home or from work. My team thought I joined an happiness cult. <laughs> so, but you know what? He said, you know what? It worked. It worked. We feel better connected. We're actually, we deal with the problems, but we deal with them. Somehow we deal with them better. And our team meetings are a whole lot more fun. You know, so there's different ways you can experiment. There's another woman um, had used this. She called it, her team was going through a lot of restructuring and change, and you probably know all about that. Um, but they used it as glimmers of light. What are the glimmers of the light at the end of each week? So think about how you can play with some of these ideas for yourself. So that's the emotion. So that's in the acronym, which I should have pointed out, and the 10 keys is great dream. So this, the emotions, looking for what's good, which we can also apply to when we're experiencing anger. I mean, anger's not wrong. Uh, anger's often we feel when there's a sense of injustice, but if we can tune into why, um, that helps us turn that anger into something constructive. Um, so it's not about being a kind of happy clappy. I really need to say that. It's not about being happy clappy, but it's about retraining your brain. Not to ignore the negative, but not to ignore the positive either. Experiment two, up for another experiment? Now, look at the people around you. Look at the people around you. Is there someone nearby, not too far away? Is there someone nearby that you don't know, you or you haven't yet spoken to today? Look at, can you spot someone? You need to be in pairs. I need you to be in pairs. I want you to try, try. I promise you they won't bite. I really promise you they won't bite. So, but I want you to try this with somebody that you don't know um, particularly well. So has everybody got someone to, um, that they can pair up with? Can you get into pairs super quickly? Here's the first challenge. This is really hard. Decide who is going to be A and who is going to be B. Hands up, A's. Hands up, A's. If you haven't got, if you're standing up, you're finding somebody. Can you two pair up? Are you, are you without a pet? Yeah. Hands up, A's. A's, right. A's, you need, I need you to pay attention to your task, your mission, which I hope you'll accept, very simple, is to quite simply share one of your good things that you wrote down. That's all. That's all. B's. Hands up, B's. Hands up, B's. Are there any bees over that side of the room? Bees? Your task is to listen to A's good thing, but I want you to listen in a very particular way, in a way that I call active and curious. All that means is when they share their good thing, say they said, oh, I had a really nice dinner last night, you might say, oh, a couple of curious, active and curious questions. Oh, you had a really nice dinner last night. Oh, where was it? Were you at home or did you go out? Were you with friends or um, did you cook it yourself? What sort of food was it? You know, um, was, it, was it a special occasion? Just a couple of questions, two or three questions, and just see what, it, what you notice. Notice what it's like to share a good thing, 
what it's like to experience being asked those sorts of questions, to ask those questions. And notice what you notice about each other. So A's, share what a good thing. B's, active, curious questions. Both, notice what you notice. Go. I hate to break that up with such a lovely sort of buzz and energy and things, yeah. So what was that experience was like? What was it like to ask a few active and curious questions? What did that feel like? Good? Other things? Interesting, interesting. So when you A's, when you shared your good things, what was it like to be asked a few active and curious questions? So, yeah? Good? What, what, how, in what way was it good? In what way was that good? Somebody actually listened. It inflated your enthusiasm, so it amplified that, sort of inflated, you know, how you felt. Other thoughts, other reflections on that activity, both of you? Both A's and B's. It's nice to talk to somebody new, absolutely. Did you feel a bit more connected having done that? Yeah, yeah. Why did you feel more connected? You just met each other? You learned something about them? Energizing? Did you find out something more for, about the other person? Than the, the, there was more you know, to that good thing than met the eye. How for, for A's, when you were asked those active, curious questions, did, you, did it make you feel like that other person was interested and cared and, and, you know, and paid attention to what was important to you? This is really interesting. What you've done is something that's called active constructive responding in the literature. So that broaden and build effect that I talked about, from the reflecting on your good things on your own, when you share a positive, a pleasant emotion, Barbara Fredrickson calls them micro moments of positivity, but being British, I find that rather hard to say. So when you share a pleasant, sort of a small moment of sort of pleasant emotions with someone else, that broaden and build effect is not just happening within each of you individually, it's actually happening between you. Um, the sort of neuroscientific studies of this call it, call it um, brain coupling. Your brains are actually coupled. And that has an amplification or an inflationary effect of those, the, the, the good, the benefits of that experience. Because when we feel we make a connection, a warm connection with another human being, we start to produce things like oxytocin, um, known as the cuddle hormone, but you don't have to cuddle to get it. Um, but what, 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 what oxyto one of the, fact, the things that oxytocin does is it actually helps us to be more attuned to the other person. Um, and, then, and then that then fuels a sort of cycle of more pleasant emotional feelings between you both and enhancing that for you both. So, there's a, so that might seem a, a nice to have, but actually there's some real powerful science behind that that is really essential for well-being. We know that feeling connected to other people, and that may mean different things for different people, but feeling there are people we can connect to, feeling seen, feeling considered, yeah, just feeling seen is a powerful thing for our well-being. That is a, um, a psychologist called Desi and Ryan um, with huge amounts of research regard our sense of connection to other human beings as an essential nutrient for psychological well-being. I mean, how many of you have walked down the corridor or a street 
um, and you've said hello to somebody and they, if they've kind of blanked you, you know, because they're in a world of their own. You kind of sort of feel that viscerally or when you're ignored in a shop or a restaurant, you feel that viscerally. We are acutely sensitive as human beings to feeling part of a group because that kept us safe. We are a social species. And in fact, we know that feeling lonely, and note I say feeling lonely, because it's, um, that means different things for different people, um, feeling lonely is more damaging to our health than smoking or obesity. You are more likely to die of loneliness than you are of obesity. So this is really, really important stuff. And we're all connected. Remember that shared responsibility, that social contagion slide I showed you? We can all say hello. We can all smile at another person. In fact, in organizations, this is Jane Dutton's research from the University of Michigan. She looked at organizations and these positive moments and how those spread in organizations and the impact on well-being. And she found that interactions as little as six seconds made a difference to individual well-being, team performance, and even the, the financial performance of the organization. So this stuff is not trivial. It's really good for our well-being. It's really good for, for you know, how we are and how we perform at work. Um, and go. But coming back to the way I asked you res to respond just now, these active and curious questions... It turns out that there are different ways we can respond when somebody shares something good with us. And in fact, the original research for this was done by Shelley Gable, and she did this work with married couples or long, people in long-term relationships. And she found that the way um, people's other half responded to um, good news when it was shared, you know, these tiny, you know, what was going well type of moments not, you know, I've been promoted or I've won the lottery type things, but just those small daily good things. She found that was more predictive of the couples rating that relationship as high quality and staying together than how their partner responded when something was going wrong. This is really powerful. I mean, we just don't think about it. But how do we normally respond when somebody shares a good thing? You know, this is, this is where I need acting skills. I haven't got them, but so bear with me. So, you know, I'm walking down the corridor at work and I bump into a, one of my teammates or a colleague and say, so, well, hi, Vanessa, how was last night? Oh, it was really nice, thank you. Um, really good, it was a lovely dinner. Oh, you had a really nice dinner, that's great. Um, how about that report we, we, you know, we, you're working on? Because I know we've got a deadline tomorrow. How does that feel? How does that make me feel? <laughs> not, not, not listened to, not, you know, not blank. So I kind of certainly haven't kind of, it hasn't sort of helped me relive and squeeze the most out of that moment, has it? But that's the most common way we respond. Yeah, really nice. That's really, I'm really pleased for you. Now let's get on with the really important business. Or, you know, or, yeah, thank you, darling. Who's putting the bins out tonight? <laughs> it applies. To, what I love about this stuff is it applies just as much at home as it does at work. Great. So it's, which is really important. Um, how about this one? Take two. Courage at work. Oh, um, hello, Vanessa. How was last night? Oh, it was really nice. Thank you. Oh. What did you do? I had this really nice dinner. Oh, did you? Oh, oh, that's funny. That's great. I had a really nice dinner too. It was fantastic, you know. My, I went to my friend's house and they had this just amazing... She's a cordon bleu chef. And she, I mean, it was just like amazing, you know. For, I mean, just pull all the stops out. Yeah, I just... You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's really lovely having a great dinner, isn't it? How does this make me feel? But, I mean, yes, we can do that as a bit of one-upmanship, but often our intention to responding to that like that is good. You know, it comes from a good place. Why might I respond to that? Why might I want, why might I want to share how I've, um, you know, I've had a good dinner too? Why might I want to do that? To relate. To show that we've got something in common. To show that I can understand, you, you know, how much you've enjoyed a nice dinner. But actually what it does is it makes the person think that you're not interested in them, you're only interested in you. It doesn't mean to say you shouldn't share your connection, but if you can ask a few of these active and curious questions about their dinner, um, not only does that help them feel more connected to you, then you've got more to, to, and they're more open to listening to your good thing, but you then you've got more to connect with. How about this one? This is my favorite one. Take three. Oh, oh, 
Oh, hi, Vanessa. How was last night? As I told you before, I had a really nice dinner. No, I had a really nice dinner. Uh, oh, you had a really nice dinner. Weren't you at that kind of well-being event last week? And you were, you know, your goal was to really kind of get healthy and eat well and stuff. <laughs> How does this make me feel? <laughs> Deflated. Why might I be doing this? Who might I be doing this with if I'm the person, you know, identifying the risks or reminding them of their goals? Why might I be doing that? It could be as a practitioner of patient. What about, you know, with your friends and your colleagues? And all of those. We do often do that with people we really care about. Now, it doesn't mean to say we shouldn't do that, but we might want to ask, you know, find out a few active, ask a few active and curious questions to ask about that dinner before we start identifying the risks. Because what in the literature, that way of responding, and often we do this with people we love most. I mean, maybe if those of you who've got teenagers, really this active, destructive way of responding um, you will be very familiar with that with, te with teenagers. Many of you probably can think of someone in your life who, whenever you share something good, immediately goes to the negatives. This on Shelley's Gable's research suggested that that actively started to destruct the relationship. It corrodes the relationship. It does not mean to say you should not identify risks, but if you can ask a few active and curious questions first people are more likely to be able to listen to those risks. I mean, like, again, on programs that I've run, I've had people partic with teenagers, I mean, people with the couples with a, at work with a sort of teams as well, but um, the, the comments with teenagers um, struck, well, one woman, um, a single mom of a, a teenage daughter, um, they were constantly having battles over money because the, the teenager was always kind of frippering money and um, the Mum was always going, oh, you've got to save, you've got to save. And so they're constantly at loggerheads. And she experimented with this. So whenever her daughter came up and talked about her, you know, next thing she was spending money on, the daughter started to get interested in why, asked some curious questions. Why? Not sarky questions, interesting, curious questions. And she said that it's just, tr she said, in three weeks, I have not had a single argument with my daughter. Think of the impact that has on her stress levels and the stress levels she takes to work. And then she said, what's more, my daughter has come up to me, come up to me in the last couple of days, and asked me for budgeting help. So this is potentially powerful. I'm not saying it works 100% of the time with everyone, but really it's worth experimenting with. Because one of the guys that was one of my sort of teachers, Chris, a psychologist called Chris Peterson, he had a mantra, he said, if you want to be happy, think about other people matter. And this is one way you can really live that out. So, and I love this quote from Maya Angelou. People will forget what you said, they will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. That's so true. We will wrap on. So can we, I think we're going to have to move quickly through. Um, go back, 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 back. <laughs> um, there we go. So we've touched on emotions, looking for what's good. And as I said, we're just tasters with food for thought. These, There's lots of ideas underneath all of these that you can do. We've touched on our connections with other people. If you notice, the first two keys, the 10 keys to happy living, one-fifth of the framework is about other people because it's so important. The first is giving. And one thing that skill, that active constructive responding does is also give people a moment of your attention. Because how often are we like this? you know, on our mobile phones, yeah, 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 I'll be with you in a minute, yeah, 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 I'm listening, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, typing away. We're not listening, we're not listening, and that signals, given, you know, what that signals to the other person is they don't matter as much as what's going on here or here. So whether you're at home or at work, the actual idea, one of the smallest things you can do to give to others, your colleagues, your family, is actually that good quality attention. You're going to have today, over the course of the day, um, we've already had, Chris talked a lot about trying things out, as did Angela, trying out and exploring all the different things that are on, um, on offer today. Um, 
You've got, there's lots of exercise classes. There's a session, I think, on sleep, um, which is really important. Um, so for us, this key is talking about um, not only taking care of our body. This was really powerful for me um, because um, uh, a psychiat psychiatrist, psychologist now realizing that exercise is not just good for our bodies, it's really good for our brain. In fact, John Ratey, who's a Harvard psychiatrist, thinks that exercise is primarily to condition our brain because it improves our cognitive function, it's protective against all sorts of mental um, illnesses. But taking care of our bodies, of course, is also about food and particularly sleep. The whole area of sleep is getting a lot more attention. I'll leave you thinking with this thought. Um, how many of you? I don't know, just ask, how many of you had seven hours or less sleep last night? You are sleep deprived, um, and we're, most of us are sleep deprived in in this country. And it's a, it has Sir Matthew Walker has written a really good book on why we sleep and show the links between lack of sleep and all sorts of illnesses like cancer, diabetes, etc., heart disease, um, as well as psychological disorders. Um, so really important. Driving ha with four hours too little sleep is the equivalent of driving having had a six pack of beer. We don't, you know, most of us wouldn't consider getting behind a wheel having um, drunk a load of beer, but we wouldn't think twice about doing that having had lack of sleep. It's really powerful. So pay attention to that. Mindfulness, there's mindfulness sessions. That's for us, the awareness. Resilience, I know there's a session on resilience, which is um, for us, I mean, a, a, a clue, uh, not a clue, a, t um, a secret, but it's not really a secret, that all of those keys to happier living are also keys to resilience. One of the most important things to resilience is what's called doctors, um, uh, uh, Stephen Southwick and, uh, and Dennis Charney, um, who worked a lot on, on uh, veterans and PTSD, etc. cetera, they've, um, they've found that the most important ingredient is what's called active coping. So doing something, feeling there's something we can do rather than nothing. And all of the keys... Um, can help people actively cope, you know. And I've, I've had people write to me who are recovering from depression, who've taken tiny steps in one key each day. I had a guy write to me, um, he'd lost his wife to breast cancer, and he wrote this lovely, um, he turned it into a blog, this lovely letter to me, which was um, how he used the keys to help him rebuild his life, um, having lost his wife of 20 or 30 years. Um, the A in dream is all around acceptance. Um, so that's about how we treat ourselves, self-compassion. I'm running a session on self-compassion. And the last key um, is on meaning. And this is about how we um, are part of and contribute to something bigger than ourselves. And I just want to finish off that with a sort of little, an exercise you might want to take away and play with for yourself or with others. Can we flick to... Um, can you just flick through and I'll tell you when to stop. Flip, 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 Let me go back. No, yeah, go, go back to the next, go to the next one. That's it. So meaning, um, having a sense of meaning. It's a funny question. It's a bit sort of esoteric. For some of us, it's very clear. For some of us, we're still figuring out. And indeed, it changes over the course of our lifespan. But the research says that people who are clear on, you know, maybe three to five top sources of meaning in their life are not only happier, they're more resilient. They're more able to prioritize. They're more able to focus on what really matters when the going gets tough. And we don't, we often, you know, we're hurtling through life so fast that we often don't stop and think about what are the really top sources of meaning in my life. So I love this. This is an activity that was developed by um, the, top, the sort of lead psychologist on meaning in the world called Michael Steiger. He's at the University of Colorado, lovely chap. And he got his students, and this is a great one to do if you've got kids, is got them over a course of a week or two to take photos or say around 12 things that are sources of meaning in their life. It doesn't have to be literally the thing or something that represents them. And then sort them and maybe come up with the top six. Maybe write a bit about why those, why those are sources of meaning. And this is a really, really powerful activity to do with your friends or even with your colleagues or a loved one. Um, 
And it's, it's just really helpful to think about what are those things that are most important things, the sort of backbone that keep you going and, and bring you joy and, and fulfillment. I mean, this was my initial punt. That's my partner. I'm really into being outside, and I love the sea, so that's a place I go to in Southern Crete. I do quite a lot of yoga. Those are my nephews. Um, they're um, holding up the moon, actually, in King's Cross. I don't know they're, they're, one of those photos. These are my really old friends. Um, I, my, having studied psychology, I trained as an accountant. So those are friends from accounting days that are still good friends. That's my street and some neighbours, and we have street party and things like that, which is good because it's a London street, really mixed. And that's my work, you know. Um, and I hope that my work has my work is about taking the science and make it practical and easy for people to apply in lives and at work in workplaces um i hope that makes a difference so those are the key sources of meaning in my life and i just really like you to think about what are your sources of meaning in your life at home and at work um and, and, and think about that over the next few weeks. So that's homework, and it's, now we've got our phones. It's a really, you can even maybe even talk about that, you know, sit out in the park when you need a break today, flick through the photos on your phone and start to think about that. So we flick through, because I'm, I'm trying to, so back, 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 back one. So, I mean, really, we've had a romp through just a taster, an indicator of some of the, the ideas and things that you can play with that are within and beneath this framework, and there's loads more on our website and the book, um, which is based on thousands of research articles, but is super practical. It's not academic, it's very practical um, in there if you want to find out more. But what I love about this science is that it's not about things that take, you know, three hours at a time to do or six months. They are tiny things that if we do um, with intention and, and practice over time, that really can add up to a make a big difference, and I know they've made a big difference in people's lives. Um, but the clue is in the name, action for happiness. It's about action. We can talk about this stuff till we're blue in the face, but it's actually what we do that matters. And I know at the end of today, you're going to be asked to... Can we click on? Click on here. You're going to be asked to think about what actions are you going to take? What are you going to do to invest in your well-being for your for your own quality of life and for the impact on the people around you. Um, Edwin Locke, um, sort of one of the top experts in goal setting, said goals are how happiness happens. So I want you to think about as you explore, as you think about that 10 keys framework, there's a 10 keys booklet in your bags. Think about the 10 keys today. Try lots of new things and think about what are the three things that I could do um, now going forward to, to invest in my own well-being. So I think that's enough for me. I think I'm Completely out of time, everyone. Um, there we go. The Action for Happiness there, the website's there. There's tons of stuff there if you want. And actually what's really exciting is David. I can see David in the room. David Smart's a GP. Um, and he's, probably, he's lots of other things as well, but I can't remember them. Um, um, and Anne and Angela and things. Uh, Northamptonshire is um, wanting to become a hub for sort of... Um, Action for Happiness, the first regional hub for Action for Happiness and really embedding this stuff in a lot of what you do. So I'm sure if you want to find out more, David, will, um, that and Anne and people, so and Angela. So um, it's exciting. So enough from me. I'll shut up now. Um, have a fantastic day. Make the most of it. It's such a treat. So see you. thank you. Thank you.